Welcome to Justin Canada. Uh, my name is Justin Douglas, and we are here today with our ongoing series of Canada's social change makers. And I have another pretty incredible guest for you today. I am here with Nakuset. She is the executive director of Montreal Native Women's Shelter, the co-president of the Montreal Urban Aboriginal Community Network, host of the TV show Indigenous Power, mother of three, and the recipient of Woman of the Year by Montreal Council of Women. So it's pretty great to have you here. Uh, we've been talking, I think maybe six months ago, we met for the first time and I've been wanting to do this interview for a very long time. So the fact that it's actually coming to fruition now is very exciting for me. Uh, so thank you for being here. We'll hop right into the interview. Okay. Uh, so you were a child of the 60s scoop, yes. uh, a not very nice way to describe a pretty traumatic experience for a lot of people. Could you mm -hmm. maybe just sort of talk a little bit about what that is, give us some context in your experience with that. What the 60s scoop is? Yeah. Okay, so in my opinion, it was an assimilation process. So when the residential schools closed down, the government still felt there was an Indian problem, and the way of dealing with it was now to do it through adoption. So whereas the residential schools were federal, the 60s scoop was provincial. So the province has allowed the social workers to go into the communities and to decide for themselves whether or not that child need to be apprehended. And a lot of the times they felt that these children needed to go because they didn't have running water or uh, they didn't have a fridge or they had an outhouse or for whatever reason or maybe you know the mother looked tired or was lying down and maybe that was considered negligent. So I think uh, 20,000 children were taken during the 60s scoop. That's one of the numbers they're discussing now. Wow. Could and, be more. And you were one of those children? I was one of those children. So what happened to you? Um, I was adopted at the age of three. Um, I'm originally from, Ma I was born in Manitoba. My community's in Lac La Ronde, Saskatchewan. But um, I was taken, um, and it might be through something called AIM, Adopt an Indian or Métis Child. What they did here in Montreal was they took pictures of Aboriginal children and put them in a catalog, but they also did it through the Gazette. So they actually had, and if you, you can what? look it up, yeah. yeah, the Gazette would have articles where, you know, instead of like adopt a puppy, well, they would put pictures of Aboriginal children and... And adopt a native child exactly. at that time. Yeah. yeah, and this has happened in 1970. So um, my parents, um, back in the day, it was called Jewish Family Services. They received a big catalog of all these Aboriginal children. They're like, choose one. So my picture came up and they're like, all right, send her over. Wow. So I came over on a plane. I was three years old. Prior to that, I'd been in many different foster homes and I'd been with my older sister. So it was difficult for my sister because she woke up one day and was like, where is she? And has been searching for me her whole life. But she found you. She did, yeah. Okay. Eventually. Eventually. To maybe just quickly talk a little bit about your experience in this sort of adopted home and what that was like for you. Um, my experience was extremely, extremely difficult. I had parents that um, didn't know enough about Aboriginal culture and certainly didn't embrace it. So they thought that if they taught me enough about Judaism and changed my name and brought me up, uh, you know, going to Hebrew school and to synagogue, that I would just be absorbed into it. So in a, in a way, assimilated. Mm -hmm. But as I grew older, and I had a blonde brother and a blonde sister, so it was very obvious that I was not one of theirs. And they were like, well, just tell people you're Israeli. Right, of course. Well, I mm -hmm. was, you know, I was like, no, I'm not gonna tell people I'm Israeli. Because even back then, I had a cultural pride, but it was really uh, frowned upon. So my parents used to give me a lot of messages that were negative like they are in the newspapers and the media. So I don't think they necessarily knew how to bring up a native child, but just basically, you know, get rid of all the roots and give them something different. What happens is that when you grow up without retaining your culture and you're clearly not from that culture, you end up having a hard time. So 85% of the adoptions failed. Are you considered a successful adoption case? No, 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 but I am in a way that most native adoptees that didn't sort of make it when they got lost, they ended up into drugs and alcohol and just really are lost. I was lost for a little while, but I was able to find my way back. And I think that part of it was um, actually my Bubby, my Jewish grandmother that gave me so much 
support and so much like she had such belief in me she would be like you're gonna do great things one day and I'm like no I'm going to jail <laughs> like they she really thought I would do great things so when I got the woman of the year award I was like wow I wish my grandmother was here to see no this kidding this is what she always saw in me but someone else I know who's also a part of the 60s scoop and is also considered successful said the same thing it was her grandmother the belief in that her the grandmother had in both of us that helped us be who we are today so what I do now is I work with Batcha and I work with um, the kids in care in terms of trying to find appropriate services for them. And now we have a Yohahio program, which means the Good Path in Mohawk. So we're trying to find mentors for those kids. They may not have a grandmother there, but let's, let's learn from best practices and, and implement that. So that's been Great. going on for the last year and a half. Excellent. Maybe can you talk a little bit about uh, the Montreal shelter system, what it is, who uses the services, how you got involved in the shelter, in the job in the first place? Okay, so I started working at the Native Women's Shelter uh, in 1999. I went in as a volunteer and uh, they hired me the next day. So I've been there for a very long time and I was able to move up uh, in different positions. I've been the executive director for the last, I guess, 12 years. Um, we have a lot of services um, at the shelter. We have an addictions counselor, we have a family care worker, we have regular counselors, we have a psychotherapist, we have an art therapist, we have elders, we have a sweat lodge at the botanical gardens, we have a holistic health worker, and we have an outreach worker. So we have a lot of specialized services to help the women that come through our doors and their children. Women come from all over Canada to the shelter. Um, people look at us more as uh, almost like a respite or like a, a wellness center now. It's not necessarily a shelter. People will refer um, clients to the shelter because they need to see the psychiatrist, uh, psychologist or they need to see the elder or you know all the different services that we have so um, basically we've been around um, since 1987 and uh, we would like to expand we'd like to have actually a traditional um, I'm sorry a, tr a transitional house mm -hmm. so when the women leave the shelter they have a safe place to stay for up to a year so they can really um, not get their lives together, but ch uh, choose like um, either a vocation or go back to school so that when they do move out on their own, they're set to mm -hmm. be autonomous on their own. And at the shelter, usually you can stay there for about three months. We have like a waiting list to get in. It's really difficult. We're the only Aboriginal shelter in Montreal for women and children. Wow. Yeah. And so what is your capacity then at this point? How many People can you help serve at a, a given time? We have 13 bedrooms and we can fit up to about 25, but not more than that. Some rooms are much larger, so we can have a whole family in there and some are just single rooms. What is the demand versus what you're able to accommodate at this point? Oh, we have to turn people away at the door, so that's unfortunate. So the demand is high, but if we have a transitional house, we can just move the women over that are ready to move, that are, are sta more stable, and then bring more women in that need the service. What sort of uh, reasons in general, I don't want you to generalize too much, but without getting into a specific case, what is uh, a reason someone would come use your services? Pretty much homelessness. Now we have a lot of Inuit clientele. They, uh, the communities are, um, there's not enough housing in the communities. Uh, the price of food is ridiculous. There's no work. And a lot of times they come over to Montreal for medical reasons and then they come to Montreal and they're like, oh my God, it's so cheap to live here. Everything is so cheap. I'm going to stay here, but they don't have the language um, and they don't have the skills. So they end up homeless. So at least 50% of our clients are Inuit. Um, and then others are here because of our services. Uh, they're referred by the communities. Um, and some are just coming from different provinces. Montreal is a very transient city. People come through all the time. There's 26,000 urban Aboriginals here in Montreal. What do you think are some of the root causes of why people, women specifically, need to use your shelter services? That's a really tough question because um, every community is different. Some communities are very, very well equipped, like Gunawage has their own social services, um, they have their own housing programs, so we don't have that many people that come from the community, but they can come from any other community, you know, in Quebec. It's really, it's hard to say, it could be domestic violence, it could be, you know, um, just violence in general, um, you know, different types of trauma, you know, I mean, it all stems from colonialism, so, Women come for all different types of reasons. And also, 
sometimes they leave because of uh, youth protection issues. When women are, are pregnant, if they, they feel they leave the community and they come here in Montreal, they'll be safe. Mm. Which is sometimes the case. Sometimes, sometimes they are safe. Yeah, and sometimes not because the social service there will call bad shot here and then we'll get police at the door saying, okay, we have a warrant for so and so and her baby. And that's always really devastating. Uh, two quick more questions about the shelter system. I've noticed uh, a little bit on your website about inclusion of uh, traditional knowledge and mm -hmm. traditional perspectives. So mm -hmm. maybe can you talk a little bit about how you incorporate that into the program? Because of residential school, we don't really know very much of our culture. So when the women come, we have a traditional healer that's there. He comes at least once or twice a week. But every morning we start with morning circle. So we'll smudge, we'll do a prayer in their language. Um, and then we also have ceremonies, you know, we'll have like a moon ceremony, we'll have different types of ceremonies throughout the year. So that's what we try to do. And of course the sweat lodge, mm. it's, it's down right now because uh, it's the winter, but it opens up again this spring. So we offer all these things to the women. But I've done the sweat lodge once. I was able, I got a wage as part of the McGill Aboriginal field course. Mm -hmm. And it was a hugely tr personal transformational experience for me. Yeah. They're, they're not easy. And I think that also scares people when they, you know, how do you go into a sweat? How do you, I, I did one too. And I, I passed out before I even got into the sweat. I was so nervous. Yeah. And I was like, I was right there with you. Please yeah. make me a good Indian. Let <laughs> me do the sweat in a good way. And you know, it's, it was, it's rough. Yeah. But I was able to do it, but not everyone is ready. And, and there's also a whole protocol. You can't be drinking or doing alcohol within the last 48 hours. And you know, there's things that you, it's, it's intimidating, but once you do it, it's life changing and I yes. would have so happy I did it. Yeah. yeah. But I felt the same way when, yeah. I, when it started. Last question about the shelter specifically. What sort of uh, response do you get from the provincial government, from the federal government? What do they do well in supporting you and what could be done better? Because we are one of the only shelters that are off reserve, our funding comes pretty much from the province or regional. Whereas all the other shelters that are on reserve come from uh, the federal government. It comes through the, the band council and they don't get very much money, unfortunately. So tell me a little bit about the network. I love the network. network. What is it? The network is great. The network uh, is something that I initiated through the Native Women's Shelter because I felt like, and especially being an urban Aboriginal and someone that's not actually brought up on a reserve, um, I would look around Montreal and I would see all these different native organizations, but no one actually spoke to each other or really knew each other or what the services were. And I thought that was a real problem because, you know, in my head as a native adoptee, I'm like, well, aren't we all supposed to stand together and be strong? So why are we not? So I brought people together. How I did this was I, brought, I sent out a, um, a survey to all the different native organizations and also non-native organizations that have a, a native clientele. And I said, would you be interested in getting together three times a year and talking about the current issues that we're facing? Would you be interested in running one of these groups? Would you be interested in creating a committee? So a whole bunch of different questions around what the network is. And everyone was like, yes, let's do it. So we all got together. And then it was kind of funny because the government was like, what are you doing? I'm like, I'm having a meeting. They're like, can we come? I'm, I'm like, you can come, but you have to pay for it. Nice. So it's coming out of the shelters. Then what we did was part of the monies went to having a, a, an actual meeting room. So renting a room and, you know, supplying food, but also hiring a, a really good facilitator. We hired Rena Daibo from, from ODS, Organizational Development Services in Gunawage, and she ran the meeting and she was able to give a historical context as to why we might need a meeting like this and what is our vision because we have to have a shared vision. So she was able to, to do this. Now it took her three meetings. We had them, you know, probably about two months apart and then we came up with the idea of the network. So okay. the Native Women's Shelter paid for the first three meetings and after that a network was established. So now what happens is, how do we address our issues? Well, there's a lot. So how do we break it down? And we decided we would break it down by uh, theme. So um, social services, we would have art culture, we would have health, we would have um, communications, we'd have youth, education, employment, there we training. Go. <laughs> <laughs> so people who had expertise in that stood up and said, I would like to join this group. And then within these little committees, they voted on a representative that would speak for the group. And then we would meet with the government every month and talk about our accomplishments. So I run the social service committee. I'm a little ambitious. I have three committees within the committee. I have justice, I have homelessness, and I have the circle of care that deals with Batshaw. 
I've been the co-chair. I've been voted in as the co-chair all this time, but I think my mandate's gonna be up soon, so eventually someone else is gonna have to take over, but um, all these amazing things happen, right? So Cabot Square is an initiative of the network. Okay, tell them for people who don't know, what's the, what's the initiative? So Cabot Square is an area in Montreal where Aboriginal people go. You don't have necessarily a reserve in Montreal, but there's an area where Aboriginal people just go to meet each other. Um, unfortunately, there's other people that go to this park and sometimes there's crime there. So it's not necessarily the safest place. When they started to build these condominiums four years ago, they wanted to do a revitalization program and, and they invited me to come. I was the only Aboriginal person there. And they're like, we're gonna, um, we're gonna take the Aboriginal people out and we're gonna put them in an alleyway. I went back to the Justice Committee and I'm like, this is what they wanna do, we have to do something better. So we wrote a proposal, I said, uh, let's have outreach workers at that park. So if people are there, they can actually help them. Why are you here? And have them speak the same language. So have someone who's Inuit or someone who's First Nation. When, you see so when you're Aboriginal and you see someone that is of your nation or, or close enough, you're more apt to talk to them to someone who's non-Aboriginal. So let's, you know, try to break down all these barriers and try to get services and have that area. They have this thing called the Vespasian turn that into an office and have all the resources on the wall and then they can come in and, and actually get help. Wow. So this is what I envisioned four years ago and now it's happening. Good for you. And it's the city of Montreal that pays for it. Um, and then we are actually got money from the McConnell Foundation to have a manager who's going to be work, who works with all the different organizations in the city and making sure we have additional services for that area and that we're all working together. That's a really good transition actually into one of the initiatives that the network has taken on and that is the relationship between Aboriginal and Indigenous peoples and the police services of Montreal. Mm -hmm. So do you want to talk about that? Maybe I'll just preface it a little bit by saying that there have been a lot of stories, not necessarily of police officers from Montreal, but of police officers in general who have perhaps uh, gone past their boundaries and uh, specifically towards Native women. And I think there's a general mistrust across Canada, not specific to Montreal, uh, that needs to be addressed and needs to be changed pretty quickly. So what is this initiative and what are you trying to accomplish with it? Well, it came through the Homelessness Committee. There was a, um, a lot of talk about what the relationship is between the people that are homeless and the police and um, mistreatment and disrespect and how do we make a better relationship. So there was a lot of talk and we came up with four points. And uh, Rachel Deutsch was someone who actually met with the police, as well as Vivian Carley from Makovic, and went to go see the police and said, these are our ideas. One is, let's have um, a missing and murdered Indigenous women's pro protocol or procedure. Um, let's have training for the police so that you learn about our culture and our, histor our history, colonialism. Um, let's have prevention programs and uh, let's have like an advisory committee because they have that for the black community, for the Asian community. Let's have one, an Aboriginal advisory committee. Um, and let's have a, let's put it in writing. And the police, and the police were like, yeah. Really? And, yes, and, and it was really funny because Rachel came to see me and I was like, yeah, that's gonna take 10 years. And she's like, oh no, it's happening in June. So June 25th, wow. I signed the agreement. I was like, I get to sign it? Great. Yeah, yeah. I, was, I was so thrilled. So I signed the agreement and now we're actually working on it. So the missing and murdered indigenous women procedure is actually something that uh, we drafted up so that when a woman goes missing the police and the community are on the same page we know exactly what to do it's step by step amazing and what we're going to do is find funding because when a woman goes missing the last people aboriginal people want to call are the police of course so we'll hire someone who's indigenous and that will be the contact and she'll work very closely with the police but make sure have you called the police yet no okay let me help you with that phone call you know and follow up because the police are like you know they'll take the report and then they'll walk away and you, ne you never hear from them so she'll make sure that they follow up and then evaluate what was your relationship like with the police and these are the support services to help you through this time and all these different things that need to happen as well as something more futuristic so if we were to have like hire someone to work in the um, bus stations and when people come off the buses that are Aboriginal, if there was a kiosk saying, are you new to Montreal, are you Aboriginal? They would give out like a little booklet or something. Go to the Native Friendship Center, go to the Native Women's Shelter, go to PAC, go to all these different places um, and be make yourself part of the community. Mm -hmm. So that way they would have ties. So there's a lot of ways to look at it to help 
and um, the network is great. We really have all these amazing, great minds that come together. I'm really excited to hear that because for me, the fact that there are so many missing and murdered Aboriginal women in mm -hmm. this country mm -hmm. is a stain mm -hmm. on our history. Mm -hmm. And the fact that most uh, mainstream Canadians, we'll call them, aren't actively engaged in trying to prevent mm -hmm. not just Aboriginal women, but any member of our society who is at risk of rape and violence and death, mm -hmm. we need to change this. And I think probably, uh, in my opinion, one of the best ways is education and really informing people who don't know the history of colonialism, mm -hmm. don't understand why we are in the situation that we're in now. I'm kind of ranting on a, bit, a little bit about it now, but I'll, I'll pass it over to you. What are your thoughts on this current situation and how do we protect Indigenous lives? Well, I think this idea that we have is great, and I think we're very close to it. It should be established in the next month, and it's even going to correspond to the 911 operators. So it's all it's going to be the police, 911, and the community. But what's most interesting about this type of initiative, it's the community-driven. It's always, it has to be us. It's never going to be the police that are going to say, hey, let's do this. Right. Like, it's very nice that Justin Trudeau just announced that, you know, we're going to do an inquiry, but we started working on this months ago because we can't wait for the government to say, hey, we're going to address your problems. So everything that we do, and that's why Cindy Blast Blackstock is so great because she put that forward nine years ago. I know I'm mm -hmm. jumping back. No, it's fine. But, do it. you know, I mean, that's what Indigenous people have to do. We have to see what our problems are, address them, and move forward and find all those fabulous people to help. Because I don't know everything, but I sure have a lot of geniuses around me to make, mm -hmm. it, make me look good. So. That's great. Uh, we're almost out of time, which I'm so frustrated about because I have so many more things I want to ask you from media representation to your talk show, the people you're interested in, how to engage Aboriginal and non-Aboriginal Canadians. And so I'm just gonna have to ask you back another yes. time. Yes. But in the meantime, Hopefully people will have a little bit of an introduction to some of the issues taking place in Montreal and will hopefully want to learn a little bit more about some of this stuff. So uh, if anyone does want to learn more, where can they find more information about you and the work that you do? Uh, well, you can go to the website for the Native Women's Shelter Done. and also you can watch Indigenous Power. Which you can see on which network? Uh, well, Bell, if it's an on-demand channel, but you can also watch it through the website. Thank you again so much for being here today. Thanks it was an right absolute on. pleasure. And I really look forward to doing it again soon. Awesome. So thank you very much. Right. Thank you.